كثير انا اسمي مزن حسن انا المديرة التنفيذية لنظرة الدراسات النسوية وفي نفس الوقت احنا مؤسسات ملتقى النساء في السياسة اللي هو المنظم للقاء ده النهاردة والملتقى هو تجمع للنساء والنسويات من المنطقة العربية ابتدى في 2015 فكرته انه يجمع نساء ونسويات من المنطقة مهتمات بسؤال السياسة بمعناه الواسع مش بس المعنى الضيق في الملتقى بيحتوي على نساء برلمانيات او كانوا برلمانيات نساء كتبنا دساتير قاضيات نساء من المجتمع المدني نساء نقابيات ونساء حزبيات وفكرة الملتقى انه تجمع سنوي لتجمع لتلك النساء من خلفيات مختلفة مهتمات بسؤال السياسة في المنطقة العربية للمناقشة وتطوير أسئلة النساء في السياسة اللي هو سؤال معقد جدا 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 يعني في منطقتنا على مستوى سؤال السياسة عامة وعلى سؤال النساء وتواجد النساء وكيفية التعامل مع النساء والنسويات وقضايا النساء والقضايا النسوية والتعامل مع الحركة النسوية كحركة سياسية الملتقى بيصدر تقرير سنوي كل سنة عن موضوع من المواضيع الملتقى بيصدر مجموعة من البيانات التضامنية وبيراقب قضواته بتراقب الانتخابات أو العمليات الديمقراطية يعني في عدة دول وبيشاركوها مع العضوات الأخريات الملتقى كمان بيتبادل الخبرة في القضايا المختلفة اللي مهتمة بيها أو المتخصصات فيها عضوات الملتقى في أشكال مختلفة وده كان يعني تجربة حوالين سؤال الانتخابات المحليات كتابات الدساتير والتغيرات اللي بتحصل في المنطقة من 2011 الملتقى من بعد الكوفيد بدايات أزمة كوفيد 19 ارتقى أنه مجموعة من عضوات ويبقوا متواجدات في سلسلة من اللقاءات حوالين قضايا مختلفة بتمر بيها النساء والنسويات في المنطقة العربية وأولها عضوات يعني في دول مختلفة أول وبينار تشرفنا بأن احنا تحدثنا مع خبيرات ونسويات ونساء عظيمات من اليمن بيتكلموا عن خبرة النسويات في إطار العنف و والتعامل مع كوفيد 19 وسؤال الحرب وامكانيات السلام انا بس عايزه انوه انه للي بيسمع بالعربي يستخدم اللغه الايكون اللي عليها الالماني والانجليزي اللغه والايكون الانجليزي للترجمه اللقاء احنا هنتكلم بالعربي كل اللي في اللقاء ولو ترجمة انجليزي فالترجمة الانجليزي على الايكون الانجليزي بس الترجمة بس الحديث بالعربي استخدام So uh, for those of you who would like to listen to the uh, Arabic translation please click on Click on English but if you're channel uh, and you will find uh, can you hear me Shit. so today we uh, we decided to talk about Lebanon and also on Beirut which is on a local level, my city. Because if I wasn't Egyptian, I would like to be Lebanese. And what happened is that Uh, the explosion did not only impact the Lebanese or only the, the women who, who live in Lebanon, but also it impacted anyone who's living in the region because uh, Lebanon uh, 
هي الباب المفتوح لينا لان احنا نتقابل ونتناقش ونتكلم الحركه اللي دايما مستوعبانا وبتسمعنا و So Lebanon and, and Beirut was, uh, was a home for me in times when uh, my, my own country was uh, really uh, harsh on me and also on other uh, feminists. The explosion that took place uh, is a really harsh question and what is happening is also harsher because uh, because it also came after a revolution that is being engendered in Lebanon for a long time now around issues of, uh, of corruption and of different socioeconomic issues and then COVID-19 came to add up on all these uh, things. And it also made things harsher. So as, uh, as women uh, working in the region, in, in the political realm and as feminists, uh, today we aim to listen to each other and to, uh, to, to uh, be in solidarity with each other. And uh, we also talk about uh, solidarity between the feminist uh, uh, in, in, in Lebanon and uh, to be in solidarity with the feminist movements in Lebanon and to, to, to raise all the questions that they have and to uh, talk about them, to discuss them, uh, especially questions uh, of, uh, of violence against women, which is a question being uh, raised and being uh, uh, threatened, uh, threatening all the women in, in Lebanon. So also the question of refugees, uh, the, the foreign workers, migrant workers, um, also the women who are, uh, who are present in, um, so, so we're really uh, glad today uh, uh, that you're with us, that we're going to be listening to us. And we hope uh, that we uh, like uh, get, become able to deliver our solidarity to you. Um, we really glad today that we have, uh, we have uh, Miss Lina with us. Um, Lina Abu Habib, who is not part of the caucus, but we're, was a very dear friend. And also, Ms. Rizan Sheikh, a member of Iraqi Parliament. We're very delighted to have you all today with us. So, from Cairo to Beirut, we send you all our solidarity. Hello, everyone, uh, my friends, my dear friends. Uh, the women that are present with us today from Lebanon. Again, I would like to repeat what Muzan said. Um, I'm in Sulaymaniyah in Kurdistan, and uh, I assure you that although I'm from Sulaymaniyah, I really like Beirut and I feel very comfortable in Beirut, um, not only to the city itself, but to its people. Um, any uh, trip, any traveling that I make to Beirut, was beneficial to me uh, on a feminist movement level, on a personal level, in terms of my thoughts, my ideas, my uh, mentality. We really need to be proud of the women of Beirut. This is uh, really uh, a reality that I'm trying to express. The, um, you have a feminist world and some ideas that we are really proud of. Unfortunately, today, after this disaster, uh, this disaster that took place in, in Beirut, when we first heard about it, it was called uh, the exclusion of uh, Beirut port. It was, it was really compared to Hiroshima, but, but I think it's a different uh, era. Um, and unfortunately, we know all these political parties, uh, their impact um, 
on, on the sit economic situation in Beirut. Uh, we also have seen their impact on the political situation in Beirut. We also have seen all these political women in Beirut who are really affected, women are, who are part of the civil society organizations, women uh, as part of households who are really affected. So today, I don't really want to talk. I want to listen from all these professors, my feminist professors, I want to uh, hear any small idea from them about the role of women uh, in Lebanon. What is the role of uh, women in Lebanon, be it in the political, uh, uh, on the political level or on the level of civil society organizations on all levels? What is their role on all levels and what can we do all together as a feminist movement or anything that would help us uh, to inc enhance the role of uh, of the women in, in Beirut to rebuild uh, their country. Uh, to begin with, I uh, will start with Dr. Josephine Zareb, if possible. So, uh, dear uh, Dr. Josephine Zareb, uh, first of all, I have a question for you. What is the role of uh, feminist leaders and uh, uh, women leaders in uh, finding a solution uh, for the catastrophe that took place in the Beirut port. What are the ways to help? In the meantime, um, we're, we have this, this question, but also we might have so many other questions around the role of civil society organizations uh, in order for us to know what is your opinion and everyone else's opinion. Uh, hello everyone, thank you so much for this really great introduction, uh, really dear introduction from um, Mozan and Rezan. I know how much you like, uh, you love Beirut and Lebanon and, and how, uh, how Lebanon uh, was really effective um, when it came to the role of, uh, of women in the political uh, sphere. Uh, first of all, this is a crime that took place in Lebanon. Let's not just uh, call it an accident that passed or that happened. It's No, it is really a crime that took place. Martyrs, um, we have so many martyrs around 200 and a lot of people are still missing. We're trying to find them. This. Uh, uh, this lack of responsibility and absence of responsibility of the Lebanese government and Lebanese authorities have pushed the local um, communities and, and the local civil society organizations and the and local women and feminists to take the responsibility that the government did not uh, really uh, hold. So all these uh, people uh, uh, were on the ground from the first day, uh, and 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 they were trying to really alleviate all the sufferings that were really huge from the first uh, day uh, uh, post the explosion. And, and we have thousands of people who, are, who were really affected, uh, but we still don't have a strategy set by the government or by the state, uh, like no clear strategy uh, to, to, to find a solution. Uh, for example, I know of someone who lost his eye and the surgery would cost him $5,000. So it is really a huge, uh, impact also financially people have lost their houses and uh, they're not able to make ends meet um, the the ministry of uh, the, the, the the ministry of um, health is, is saying that they will just gather some uh, funds from outside to, to solve that problem but it's not really efficient and we thought that we might be able to feed the people and you know like uh, clean the glasses but the problem is much bigger than this some people have lost their houses and others have lost organs uh, uh, and they've lost their bodies so we do see feminist leaders uh, on the ground uh, leading really big organizations uh, visiting people in their houses trying to take uh, hold of uh, the responsibility so maybe perhaps this is what sh uh, where the the Lebanese women today are uh, present uh, when it comes to uh, humanitarian and legal assistance uh, amid the absence of the state who didn't even apologize or didn't even clarify how it will go forward uh, with the crisis and no none of them have uh, spoken up none of them from the state i mean and um, maybe the question is uh, the absence of the the state the absence of the government absence of the, of the authorities uh, perhaps this is really the situation in lebanon today i don't know if i uh, translated the situation well but yes as you said uh, josephine 
um, the, the political situation today and and the irresponsibility of the state who uh, since uh, most of the ministries have uh, resigned and um, uh, the government resigned we we need this we need this time to know what is the opinion of the women who are active in uh, in, in local organizations in in, in the situation um, most families don't have houses don't have shelters uh, so it's true that the, some organizations are present today to support these uh, people but we need to also know what is uh, the role of these women who are part of these houses who were lost um, what is the situation of these women uh, who were affected and their houses were affected so most of the streets that were affected in Karantina and Jamaisa and Mar Mikhail, there are so many elderly women uh, who are aged above to 80 years old and, and they're living alone and in houses that can be described as uh, really small houses uh, that don't have the, the minimal uh, amenities needed. Uh, so kitchens and, and bedrooms were uh, destroyed. And these women do not want to leave their houses and uh, in, in the organization of Beit, um, we try to host people uh, who were effective, affected, but um, others did not really want to leave their houses because they're under the, the old uh, rent system. So they're afraid to leave their houses because that would mean that the, uh, uh, the, the owner of the houses would take them uh, from them. So regardless of the destruction, these women don't want to leave their houses, but they are still suffering. And we're trying as much as possible to help them with minimal um, resources because we're not organizations that have millions of dollars. We, we have really limited resources, but we're trying to help in the renovation or providing, for example, refrigerators and, um, and, and we're trying to see how we can uh, help them when we visit them. We we're listening to them. Uh, we check on them regularly. One of the women told me that she has a lack of she suffers from a lack of hearing and she's still listening she's still listening to the to the sound of the explosion the sound keeps on repeating in her head um so and they, they also saw people who were uh, thrown uh, three or four meters when the explosion happened um so we have a, a psychosocial uh, support uh, employee who is helping them and listening to them to see how uh, what 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 psychosocial support uh, we can provide to them because they're still listening to the sounds of the explosion we're trying to be next to them i know of a woman who hasn't seen her son to this date uh, we're trying to tell her that they will find him but the problem is really huge that um, then it's, it's just a disaster, a really huge disaster that even the Lebanese Red Cross, which is a big organization, is saying that um, the, the, the destruction is, is much bigger than its uh, capacity to, to deal with it. And, and the needs are really bigger as well. So we're trying to uh, remain uh, next to these women and these families who are still in their houses, but we're not uh, really, um, uh, we're really, we're really not having enough time to to catch uh, and and to be uh, to commit to commit to all these families because we have so many families in need, uh, and and we're having 20 to 30 volunteers a day. The first day we had 100 100 volunteers, but we were cleaning uh, the glasses on the streets. So we're trying to support them, but we really need, they, they actually really need people to listen to them on the long term. I think the first phase um, is over. Now we're in the second phase uh, where uh, building and uh, construction is uh, coming to take place because winter is approaching really soon. And if the houses are not uh, uh, rehabilitated and uh, fixed before the winter, uh, then they will suffer a lot uh, from, uh, from the rain and the effect of the winter. So women are s standing by each other. There are some uh, WhatsApp groups. Um, for example, they're, they're trying to, to provide medical assistance, um, milk for children, and uh, any kind of assistance. Um, so they're coordinating the feminist uh, 
uh, activists together, but this is not enough. So we need something that is really bigger to help us because if we, if we keep on working on 20 uh, to 30 houses a day, uh, this is not enough because we're, we're talking about thousands of, of houses who are in need. Now, last question uh, before we return back uh, to you. Um, do you think that, um, that there are some voices uh, that, that are reaching the, the ears of the politicians at all? Unfortunately, Razan, no, I don't think so because the, the authorities are not uh, responding at all. Thousands of protesters uh, demonstrated on Saturday right after the explosion and the spirit of the protest and the revolution was uh, uh, revived, but uh, the protesters were faced with live uh, bullets and uh, people were not afraid. Uh, they kept on protesting uh, even um, like from 4 p.m. to 8 p.m. They kept on on uh, 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 steering um, arms on us and firing arms. So, and they're now talking about uh, bringing back a national unity government, which is the same form of government that caused this explosion and that we're used to from the last years. They're still talking the same way they used to. They're talking about uh, the consociational system and the distribution of uh, positions in the government based on, uh, uh, on a sectarian basis among the sects. They're not understanding that what happened is a nuclear um, a bomb, uh, and they're not uh, uh, acknowledging this. They're not. Uh, um, uh, they're not sorry of the Lebanese people. Even uh, the judge that was um, appointed to, uh, to 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 see uh, what can be done legally. Uh, I think he, uh, he doesn't even have the principles of uh, of, of legal uh, uh, prosecutions. So I think. Um, I think the, the, the resignation of the government was political and this is due to, um, uh, this is due to how much uh, a political party wanted to take it out. So I, I think the authorities and the political parties are uh, very far today from what is going on on the ground and from this disaster. Uh, they are not present at all. This is not just a personal opinion. Uh, from the first day we were looking for the municipality of Beirut and, and, and no one was there. Uh, we were trying to find people to help us, but, but like, no one was there. Not even the local authorities, not even the political party until today. They're just talking about a new government, the same government as before without any radical changes in the system, which is something that we're calling for. We're calling for a civil system that abolishes the sectarian system. So we don't really have any, any, uh, any kind of hope or uh, trust in this government. And if we do not protest and demonstrate, no one will. Thank you, I'll get back to you. Now uh, with Ms. Jumana. Ms. Jumana, I want to ask you about this political situation. Uh, we know principally that even before the government and before this uh, disaster in Lebanon, certainly this disaster requires a, an effective state and uh, and, and, and political uh, contributions by local and international organizations and neighboring countries. But it needs, like the state needs to have a specific entity. Uh, so even us, we're outside of Beirut and we're not seeing any political uh, uh, activism on the ground by the, by the state. Uh, let's say political presence uh, in, 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 in real words. So, um, First of all, uh, I, I really would like to thank Nazra for this um, initiative, not because it is, uh, it is aimed at discussing the situation in Lebanon and because we're really stressed out in Lebanon, but because uh, solidarity among feminist movements is, um, 
is the dream of anyone who desires a democratic change, a democratic change. And, and feminist solidarity is perhaps the most important question for us in this era uh, that is really bad only on on um, on the level of uh, the quality of life that we're living and the current democracy that is absent in our countries and uh, um, the oppressive regimes that we are under but on top of that COVID-19 came to save all these regressive and dictator dictatorial um, uh, regimes that we are living under. Thank you Josephine for talking about the situation today amid, amid the explosion that is um, a crime against humanity in all levels all the human rights were impacted um, on a large scale and a systematic way. And uh, for me, I know that uh, all the people involved in the state were aware and uh, had prior knowledge about this explosive material that were present in the port. And the um, disaster took place as a part of the corruption of this political system that is really corrupt and that is uh, governing us. Now, I want to talk about the revolution of uh, 17 October that was um, a, a, a somehow uh, hope, some hope for, for us uh, in terms of the political movement uh, in, in Lebanon in the face of the sectarian uh, leaders in Lebanon. Since the Taif Agreement in 1992 date, these political leaders were capable of stealing all the money of the state and all uh, the resources of the Lebanese state and of the pe Lebanese people and has led uh, they, all these political parties and political uh, figures have led Lebanon to what it has reached. Uh, there was a series of uh, movements uh, taking place in Lebanon, activism and protests uh, starting in 2010. 2015 and then 2019 they were calling for a civil uh, state and um, secular state until we reached the, the, the revolution of the uh, 17th of October which, which ignited the revolution we're not capable of enduring and tolerating this humiliation um, and these, these policies uh, that are putting people in, under poverty, which is something being done by all the political parties, all the political parties, all the political sectarian parties that are now in, uh, in, in, in the authority or not, because, because uh, the democratic opposition is not what builds uh, um, the democratic opposition, some of it was also part of the system, of the corrupt system. Uh, the political corruption, uh, the financial corruption, until we reached a debt of uh, 11 billion uh, dollars. So I think, I think, uh, so all these uh, people, uh, until we uh, reached a phase where all the services are uh, are really affected badly, uh, so people uh, took took uh, this took onto the streets to respond to this daily humiliation that they are living, based on a report that was produced by Esqua um, very recently this month. Uh, it it says uh, that um, the percentage of poverty in Lebanon was 28% uh, people uh, revolted and then uh, it has become in the first half of 2020 55% this is the estimation of ESQUA which was produced a week ago uh, so imagine this is the percentage before the explosion so imagine now today uh, post the explosion how much uh, this uh, percentage has increased Especially that uh, 
the areas that were affected by the explosion are among the most, uh, uh, like the poorest areas. And um, as an outcome, um, uh, women in Lebanon, the situation of um, the status of Lebanese and non-Lebanese women residing in Lebanon. When I talk about women in Lebanon, I don't talk only about Lebanese women. I talk about any women living in Lebanon that, and that the Lebanese state is responsible for, um, for providing them with, with their uh, rights. So in the evening of uh, the 17th of October, um, the, 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 the exchange rate of dollar was 1,500, but now it's, it's almost 8,000. Uh, liras for one dollar. So prices are uh, four times bigger, and um, the uh, the value of uh, of of the money is really low. Those uh, who had money in their uh, bank accounts and the banks were uh, disappeared. So uh, the bank would tell you, yes, you do have some money in your account in your bank account, but you cannot really benefit from it until COVID-19 came. So amid COVID-19, all this uh, political and uh, economic context has exacerbated the situation. COVID-19 was the solution for the state to, uh, to uh, uh, stop the people from protesting. Unfortunately, amid COVID-19, women, all the women around the world, not only in Lebanon, were subject to highest levels of violence, especially domestic violence. Um, in the context of the revolution in Lebanon, um, violence that, uh, like the violence that women were subjected to was really, really harsh and painful because we were in the, in the phase um, of uh, collapse, um, a really fast collapse and then COVID-19 came on top of that to increase that collapse. A lot of institutions and stores uh, were closed. A lot of employees were fired. And when we talk about this, we, 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 we are saying uh, women were affected first, women employees and the allowances of women as well. Um, since institutions were uh, decreased, decreased the salaries of women, of, of all employees in general, women uh, uh, also were affected by this. And we're not talking about small institutions, but also really big institutions such as uh, banks who uh, made new contracts with their employees and lowered their salaries. So amid COVID-19, as we said, violence increased against women poverty increased, unemployment rates increased, and the most vulnerable populations were those who paid the, the, the expense of such a disaster. We're talking about Palestinian refugees, women Palestinian refugees who are in camps where you cannot, uh, where there are some curfews, uh, you can even breathe. We're talking about Syrian refugee women in Lebanon. And we're talking about other uh, 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 women uh, who are mainly the migrant workers in Lebanon who uh, were also badly affected because their uh, monthly salaries were uh, around $200, which was 300,000 liras. But then now uh, they are uh, about um, 2 million Lebanese liras, which is uh, higher than the salaries of, their, uh, of the people that they work for. So uh, a lot of those migrant workers were, were left on the streets without their salaries. And, uh, and, 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 and then all these migrant workers were only saved by the social, by the civil society organizations and not the state because uh, only the civil society organizations accompanied these w migrant uh, workers and uh, we're not going to mention how the quality of services was uh, was really badly affected for women with disabilities rural women all of this 
under the explosion. So imagine how big is the disaster in Lebanon, not only when the explosion happened, but also with the collapse of the, the entire uh, political and economic and financial situation. I don't want to be uh, uh, very pessimistic, but I want to say something from the 17th of October to date, the only hope is uh, from women. Women are the only hope since seven, the 17th of October today. Women were the, were the subject of resilience, of relief, of uh, fighting, of um, uh, civil uh, uh, peace, uh, and anything that is beautiful in this, in this country is, uh, is headed by women. Women had the revolution. Women had decision-making capacities in the revolution. They, do, they did not only mobilize uh, uh, the, the, the public, but they were very creative in finding uh, mechanisms, um, uh, very civil mechanisms to fight such an oppressive state that was oppressive in all ways and, 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 and firing live bullets to tear gas to, uh, to, to, to like extreme violence. And even on the 8th of August 2020, after the explosion in three days, we were, uh, we were faced with live bullets. Uh, the Lebanese state is not a friend of women. Um, and uh, and uh, the, the domestic uh, uh, violence law in Lebanon is really weak. And all the laws on households cannot protect women. Laws in Lebanon do not really protect women in any way. And imagine uh, when we had the Ustink movement in Lebanon in 2015, women, women in uh, police stations were humiliated uh, to a large extent. Why? Because they wanted to diminish their decision-making position. But I would say that they were clearly, all these women, all these feminist women were really strong. It was very clear that they were uh, the, the leaders of uh, change, uh, the builders of the democratic, secular, civil state when it comes to uh, gender equality. And I would say that our strength as feminists uh, lies here, lies on the fact that we are uh, calling and demanding a civil and rightful state, a state of uh, equality where we can fight all the political leaders from all the sects. Um, there is no equality in such a sectarian and corrupt system that, uh, that deals with, uh, with the lives of the people in Lebanon, and especially when it comes to personal status laws. So I would say that feminists in Lebanon today have their role in, in, in building this, uh, this uh, civil, uh, democratic, uh, secular state that would preserve uh, the, the, a dignified life and human rights for everyone. I will leave the floor for my colleagues. I have a question. First of all, uh, really, I salute uh, your, uh, all what you said and all your efforts. Do you think this time women uh, from Le like Lebanese women can change this corrupt politics in Lebanon? I don't want to be pessimistic, but I am realistic. Uh, the history of Lebanon says that all the changes that took place were changes by, uh, by sectarian um, agreements. So uh, Lebanon was going through a lot of issues um, uh, that are labeled under sectarianism. So this sectarian politics in Lebanon um, and any reconciliation efforts in Lebanon were sectarian because they would provide uh, much more authority for each sect. And whenever there is one sect that is, um, that is in authority, then we would consider that uh, the, the democratic change is, is hard. Um, I do not see any reconciliation that would take place under the, uh, under the protests. I do agree that it's not the people who protested that uh, made the government resign. It is uh, actually the prime minister who made the, the, the government resign. If anything would happen, uh, 
because of the regional re reconciliation between the United States and Iran with uh, including all the factors and all the different uh, actors such as uh, Turkey and Russia and the, the very weak Arab uh, actors as well would impact maybe. I am not optimistic that we are going and maybe there is a regional reconciliation uh, that's going to take place. And I hope so, because we need to stop the collapse of the state so that we can, uh, we can uh, start again with concepts of citizenship and exchange of authorities in a peaceful way. And all the mechanisms for peaceful change, democratic change, but not under the current situations that Lebanon is facing with this really huge crisis. Thank you. I will definitely come back to you. So, uh, Miss Lina, we know all these. Uh, uh, we know that this this um, explosion that took place at the port is not uh, just like a normal explosion. Um, we do know all the corruption that is present in, in this state. And so this corruption and this economic crisis, how can we uh, talk about it uh, in, in, in Lebanon? So, uh, so, so all of this, these conditions uh, during all the, the last years, uh, have led the state to the stage and us some neighboring countries have also Im impacted Lebanon to reach this stage I want to hear your thoughts about this thank you so much Razan I want to first thank our uh, friends in Nazra um, Despite all the current situation, we are uh, in thinking of Egypt and especially of our friend Muzin, because despite everything, Nazra and Muzin are still subject to types of, of oppression that are unbearable, really and uh, some kind of pressure that is uh, really uh, related directly to their uh, work and human rights and feminist uh, uh, movements. So I really thank them for this solidarity that they are holding with us today. Uh, my friend Razan, uh, uh, in regards to your question, I want to link um, what, what you said to, to what uh, my friend Jumana has mentioned. The starting point in Lebanon is, is inequality. So, um, so the, the starting point in Lebanon is the systematic and institutional inequality in personal status laws and sectarian laws. Women in Lebanon are not citizens. They are under the patronage of the sects. This is what is leading to all the disasters that we have reached. I will give a small example about the strength of these sectarian institutions that are really uh, ruling this country. Uh, over a year ago, I guess, a member of the parliament in, uh, who is part of the uh, the strongest uh, militarized party in Lebanon was not capable of uh, saving his daughter from the personal status laws in the Shia court, the Shafari court. Uh, so we're talking about someone who is capable of closing the country and of doing a war, was not capable of doing anything with the leaders of his sect. Um, and he's just an example for us. But uh, uh, for us feminists, we, we wanted to see who really leads the country and who decides what. 
um, who decides, uh, who takes decisions about the lives of the women. This is first. Second, as you said, if we want tomorrow, for example, to show the result of the corruption, let's call it Let's call it the crime of the port. Uh, the crime of the port, as my colleague in, at AUB has called it, um, is something that we need to, to teach and to understand. How can corruption and the corrupt people ruling this country all over these years lead to the destruction of the city? And this is actually what happened. The city has gone. Now, we're not only in front of the crime of the port, we're also in front of a patriarchal, religious, sectarian a system that is uh, just uh, uh, operating as if nothing happened. The, the, the religious courts are uh, not impacted at all uh, by the revolution. So as long as these institutions exist and have their own resources and contacts and networks inside the country and outside the country, uh, and by this I mean all these sects, all these sects have figures and leaders who are not in Lebanon. They're all outside Lebanon. And some of them, some of them have their armed uh, proxies so as long as these institutions exist in Lebanon, they are protecting corruption in Lebanon. And maybe this is happening today in Beirut, but it might happen again elsewhere, and we don't know where, and it might cause some destruction elsewhere. As my friend uh, Jumana has mentioned, and also uh, friend Josephine, uh, given the little that we have, the, 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 the feminist work, the direct feminist work after such a disaster was on the front lines. We have seen the feminists on the front lines with very minimal resources and no, uh, and no training. So these individuals who were activists in the um, 17th of October revolution were present uh, after the explosion to take this responsibility. And uh, we were just talking uh, before the meeting that it is really uh, a risk for us to exist and not uh, work and so she going away from the main weapons and to face the sects in the religious work. So how can we get rid of the institutions of the sects, which are uh, the biggest uh, burden on this country. So this is the second aspect that I wanted to mention now. When it comes to the third one, uh, it started with the uh, revolutions all around the Arab uh, countries and it continued amid COVID-19. As long as there is a crisis in this region, which is, you know, uh, Razan, in one of our conversations, as you know, among our uh, Arab states, uh, they don't they don't coordinate with each other, but only the uh, the ministries of uh, internal affairs do, and the feminist movements uh, do. Uh, we each uh, coordinate separately for different reasons, but I can see that feminist movements all throughout the revolutionary period in the Arab world since 2011 were cooperating closely with each other. And um, regardless of the various causes that we're working on, we are all facing a corrupt, violent, patriarchal uh, um, system. Um, so with its 
differences and varieties, the feminist movement amid COVID-19 and after the explosion has come together. You see us always together and in solidarity with each other, regardless of our um, differences. So also I want to say that there was something really special that started in uh, the, uh, the, revo the October Revolution. And uh, maybe now it's really clear um, it is the accumulation of some work that started during the last years of feminist uh, activists. Uh, we can see now that we can see now that uh, the voices of the LGBTQI communities are more heard, the voices of the refugees and the voices of the queer communities. So as a feminist, I am very proud that we are capable now of seeing these voices uh, that have the same demands and the same analysis of uh, the situation in the Arab uh, countries and the same desire for change. And, and really, we, we did not have these voices first for two reasons. Perhaps because us as a feminist movement from tens of years, we did not really open up the, the space for, um, for being uh, uh, welcoming for these uh, voices. And the second uh, reason would be the oppressive, uh, the oppressive uh, face of the, the institutions, of the patriarchal institutions. And, um, and, and we, know, we know our uh, colleague who passed away uh, in Canada, our Egyptian colleague, uh, is an example of how the oppressive institutions would, would lead to, uh, would lead us to, want not to continue uh, again. So we are in front of a situation that cannot not, uh, move forward anymore. And if it moves forward, move forward, today they destroy Beirut, tomorrow they will destroy another city. So we have, have a president that did not uh, 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 say sorry or give his condolences to express his condolences to the, to the Lebanese people at all. So the, so caring for the residents of Lebanon is not there at all. For the current uh, system to continue because it is a killer, it kills us, um, and and this is simultaneously, in this case, this 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 system, this system is really strengthened by the sectarian also. Uh, also really, uh, I would call it a killer system. So these two are strengthening each other and it also led to the killings of, of women. And this is also the case in Egypt and in, 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 the, in Iraq. So I think we reached, uh, we reached a consensus among us. Maybe the explosion uh, accelerated uh, this conclusion that it's either us or them. If they continue, that means they, that us, we cannot continue. So the, the only solution that we have and the only option is the continuity of the fight, to continue the fight against them. Uh, so, and this is, can be done through our feminist movement that is in solidarity with each other as well as with the diversity of voices inside the feminist work, as well as uh, to look on the issues that are not being tackled or talked about and which impact women most. So all these that are not really uh, being on the spotlight, for example, uh, the, 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 the work uh, the work of, of women um, and the rights, the reproductive rights and sexual 
uh, rights of of women that are taken by the uh, by the, all the religious institutions and courts. So this is also part of our struggle and fight, as well as the voices of all women and young girls, the LGBTQI community, the queers, the migrant workers, the, the refugees, uh, all the, the, the women residing in Lebanon from all these uh, vulnerable communities. So the type of work that is um, is is being uh, done and was being done under the revolution and as we are seeing also uh, in Palestine, Iraq and Egypt this is what we are seeing that feminist solidarity is the solution for us so uh, we can see now that, uh, that the, the countries who are under the uh, international coalition uh, they they want something from 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 lebanon and and also the political parties are seeking all those international donations now these neighboring countries who do not have anything to provide to lebanon um, most of the political parties are only benefiting from us and from the donations but us, we are not really benefiting from the political parties. I feel that even our clothes, we are giving them to our state. So um, no civil po uh, political parties or secular political parties. So why are we uh, sticking to our own political parties, but not to other countries? So. I think everything for us stops on certain points. Uh, all of us at the end, as people, as human beings, have different opinions and that need to be respected, respected by everyone in our countries. All the political parties belong to the states more like to their own states more than belonging to regional uh, entities or coalitions. You can see the, the French uh, president who was on the street with the people, but the prime minister of Lebanon could not really be in the street with the people. So, uh, so the belonging of political parties in Lebanon are for, uh, for regional um, have regional uh, allegiances. As you know, the political parties in Lebanon are sectarian parties, um, and none of them has uh, the people as their main source. Um, some of them has Iran as their source, others have the other countries as their source. But I always think that their main source, these political parties' main source, is their personal benefits. In order for them to remain in their positions. So I think there are two things, two main things that changed. Even if we are talking about the main political party that is armed in Lebanon, there are two main points. The first is the fact that all the political parties failed in in my opinion, they all failed in, in their promises. They all promised their, uh, their narrow uh, 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 supporters, groups of supporters. They had some promises to their supporters, but I think they did not really provide any well-being uh, to, to their supporters. They only provided a clientelist system. Uh, that is really humil humiliating. And unfortunately, I don't understand how some people are still following this, these political parties. I hope one day they will uh, wake up. But uh, I think yeah, some, some of these parties failed on a very narrow level as well in keeping their promises. Second of all, most of these political parties, even as feminist entities and following up on feminist issues, they... Uh, 
they failed in front of their women. They failed in in saving their women from the politi from the religious courts. Uh, thus, they disappointed uh, a lot of their uh, people who were supporting them. So the situation of people is declining, not improving at all. This may have affected uh, people in terms of rethinking uh, about following these people. Uh, this is in addition to the humiliation and the oppression and 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 the poverty, because these political parties are buying their supporters. So I don't think that this has a future, because especially the resources, the financial resources of these political parties are uh, weakening. So the ability of these political parties to buy their supporters is declining. And, and you know that some political parties had some derivatives and had uh, other branches in other countries and all this needs a lot of resources so i think uh, when it's called what is called um, like the public of a party or the supporters of a party of a political party in lebanon is declining this is my feeling might not be true but uh, but your inability to protect women in issues that are related to divorce, child custody, and domestic violence, and to leave them without doing anything. So, like, when when would you want your political party to save you? You want the political party to save you in these issues. So, when it comes to such issues, and those women are not protected by their political parties, uh, they would they wouldn't have the like their fight wouldn't be done by anyone but the uh, feminist organizations and civil society organizations so these are parties that we cannot rely on these are political parties that are only looking for their own benefits and interests and uh, and how to remain in the, in the power we never heard any uh, any platform or agenda that was actually uh, applied they never said the truth. Uh, they're part and parcel of all this corruption, and none of them can say that he or she is neutral. At least if you saw or you knew and you remained silent, then you are part of this crime and you contributed to this crime. So for me, all of them are, are, uh, are, are just uh, parasites for us. <laughs> they're taking our resources, their productivity are under zero. Uh, they're only being harmful more than helpful. Uh, and I think, I think that after the revolution, and now if we can say the repositioning and the rethinking of, of what are the most successful strategies for 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 the continuity of the revolution are all thoughts that we don't really need now it's not a structure that we can rely on now or that we are in need of now um, so this is part of the structure that i was talking about which are things that we need to get rid of uh, so so all these parties that uh, that they think that we they need to 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 represent people or that they are going to take uh, some uh, upcoming ministries or that were on hold of other ministries they are part of the burden they're part of the sectarian system and thus they are part of the same framework that says it's either us or them so so uh, we either remain in the same way or we fight them thank you thank you so much now we will uh, be talking to amal amal every uh, you told me that uh, every night you're only capable of sleeping for one hour and a half only but but we like we keep on saying that thankfully you're 
you're in your own house and and when we think of other women who don't have any house or shelter and they're on the streets how can how can these women so 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 like when it comes to an explosion of this of this size um how can these women make ends meet or move around or so and also what's the situation of our hospitals two days prior to the explosion of the port um, one of the pictures that was shared over social media and went viral is a picture of a woman who had COVID-19 and she went to Beirut but no one uh, received or accepted to receive her at their hospital so so given all these hard situations what happened uh, i want to hear more from from amal about the situation of our people our women on the streets hello and thank you so much for this uh, convening I would like to thank all the participants for thinking of this uh, convening because it's really helpful. I just want to uh, comment on uh, on everyone, but uh, but now I want to say that the problem in Lebanon is the fact that the political parties who were the main militias of the civil war are the ones who are in hold of the authority in Lebanon today. All these people were not used for accountability. They were not used for being hold, held accountable. This is why uh, they 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 remained in power and their political parties. The main difference is that they just put aside uh, their uh, uh, their arms and uh, and now they're in hold of the state and they're distributing uh, their shares in the state for uh, the for purposes of their own uh, interests and their supporters' interests. And in, 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 in previous uh, protests, those political parties were, were always mocking us. Uh, when we go and uh, demand our own rights, they would mock us, they would look at us in an irony, they would be ironic and would say that we are uh, there against them. Uh, instead of saying that, well, we are, just, uh, we are just fighting for our own rights. So all these people who were there in the civil war, fighting now have each uh, a political and religious figure so we are now fighting these political parties and the religious figures who are the religious coverage of these corrupt politicians so it is a coalition between corrupt groups who were fighting in the civil war and then moved after the civil war to the authorities they did some coalitions and uh, uh, agreements with the religious figures and they continued in power until we reached this, this the crime of the explosion. I lived the civil war in part, but I haven't faced anything like the explosion of the port in August 2020. We first thought that it was an earthquake, uh, but then we thought it's an explosion going uh, uh, right next to us. Everyone thought it's it's happening in their own building or in the building next to them. Uh, and how, uh, wherever I walk in Beirut, I only see destruction. I see all the destruction in, in uh, mostly in Ashrafi area, but uh, it's also expanding much more than this. Uh, the, the, the night when uh, the explosion took place, the state was absent. I mean, the municipalities, uh, the security agencies, uh, um, as if we are not living in a state. Uh, the state is an entity being led now by civil society organizations, helping in, in moving uh, uh, injured people. And I assure you that the number of uh, the of the dead and of the injured would have been much more than this uh, if the civil society organizations did not help the injured. Three hospitals are out of service completely. And even, uh, even before this crisis, before this explosion, you know, we are 
living under a financial and economic collapse and the absence of services in Lebanon. You know, most of the Lebanese people in Lebanon don't have insurance, medical insurance or health insurance, and most of the people who go to the hospitals um, uh, are only uh, received for COVID. Uh, the, the, the country was closed uh, because of COVID, and the hospitals are now only receiving people for COVID, but then, uh, and like for example, the state closed the, closed the, the, the country for three times, uh, so that they are getting equipped to fight COVID-19. But then the, the Minister of Health is the first person who did not really abide by the precautions of COVID-19. So I would think that this is just, the, the problem is not the explosion. The problem is, the problem is the fact that people lost their houses and their uh, main sources of income. Other people were affected physically people were uh, people lost their organs their eyes uh, their legs etc the state is elsewhere uh, the state is elsewhere is not providing any any uh, help and also the help is not uh, enough it's not also the main thing to do, to be done um, the work on on the ground is only being done by civil society organizations None of the politicians visited any of the injured in the hospitals. None of the politicians visited the affected areas by the explosion. Even when, when the head of, of, uh, of uh, when the governor of Beirut uh, spoke about the explosion, he didn't really say uh, how accurate the explosion reached the other uh, areas. Areas are are uh, uh, they would reach the suburbs of Beirut, the northern suburbs of Beirut, but none of them really walked around to see all the damage. People lost their houses, people are on the streets. There's an upcoming disaster that we are going to, uh, to, to reach soon. Uh, the disaster is not only the explosion that took place, the disaster is uh, what is going to happen next. So I know each time they try to uh, recreate themselves um, because international communities are all about interests of countries, and I'm sure that we will pay the, the will pay off the price of all their reconciliation efforts as people. Uh, so I think now there might be a reconciliation. To, to give the country to a certain regional power or international power to a certain regional entity or, or, or be it a local or regional entity. But in all cases, when this happens, the main victims are the people and the most vulnerable in the country. Uh, so these people will pay the price. Unfortunately, we're already, we lost already, but we will lose more. Uh, so there is a humanitarian aspect that will happen if a reconciliation takes place, if nothing would be taken into consideration, the individuals and their lives and the humans that are in need of help here. I think they're just leaving us, leaving us for the destiny. None of, the, none of them has the responsibility to improve the situation. I don't think that the civil organizations have the power to fight those political leaders who were part of civil war militias. And I also, I'm just trying to say the, this, uh, this bitter reality. So the work on the ground and the relief work is, is really huge. And, and the states are uh, coordinating and, and assisting. So, so uh, yes, it is not absent. Uh, this help of the civil society organizations is ongoing. Do you mean just uh, support by the civil society organizations? Uh, I, I, mean, uh, I mean that, for example, with the effort of the civil society organizations and not the, uh, of the local organizations and not of the municipality of Beirut and the state and the army. Uh, 
And also the state does know that they need to distribute the resources and the aid and the funds that they are receiving and the, and the parcels of support that they are receiving to the organizations because even the funders, the state funders are now, now, are now trying to make sure that all these, uh, um, all the support is being sent to the local civil society organizations. And there's a distribution of work. There is a very well coordination. Also, a lot of people are sending money from outside for, uh, for organizations in Lebanon directly because they're also afraid to send them through bank transfers because for some families, securing money uh, for some families is, is really important to be insured through trusted people and because some people needed to you know, like fix some home utilities, like TVs. So people are really inventing and creating ways and mechanisms to support each other in coordination with each other while the state is in coma. I will repeat my question again to you. These international aids and support by international actors, if it's, if it's by states, it is going to reach the state and not the civil society organizations. Do you expect that uh, Lebanon, if uh, Lebanon now is, is without a state, without a government, how will people benefit from the support being, uh, being uh, channeled to Lebanon um, when it comes to, to fixing the streets and the lands and the buildings? Do you think that the Beirut municipality can take on this responsibility? Or do you think that political parties will intervene again in this humanitarian aid? So will the humanitarian aid be politicized again? Because we know, because we know, for example, such as in Iraq, the elections, uh, early elections took place in Iraq. Uh, early elections in Iraq is a demand. Uh, by the people and we know how they are dealing with us there is a fear there is a fear that these political parties would take hold of this uh, humanitarian aid the governor of Beirut uh, assigned appointed a consultant for himself to to supervise and monitor um, this humanitarian aid and this person is affiliated with Jibran Basir, with the Free Patriotic Movement, and people had some uh, uh, rejection. The people rejected him because he would be gathering information about the people who are getting uh, help and also information about the places that are being uh, helped and also uh, the names of the organizations through which the help is going. So. For example, if we're, if we're talking about big organizations like Caritas, it's fine. But if we know that a small organization from outside Beirut is here and it's being appointed to, to supervise on the humanitarian aid from outside Beirut, then we don't accept because we do not know for sure that this particular NGO is uh, reliable or trusted and it's not part of a political party and that the humanitarian aid will not be politicized. And if the data will not be taken for other purposes, used for other purposes, how will they ensure that they will, sub uh, they will distribute the aid equally or they will provide the aid to their own political parties? So we rejected this consultant uh, of the governor that is politically affiliated with the Free Patriotic Movement. And then the army intervened because we are under uh, an emergency uh, uh, situation in Lebanon and the army has the power to intervene. So the army issued um, uh, a decision asking all the organizations to, um, to go and uh, register their names to, re to remain in the relief work. And we still have a series of questions. Can I comment on, can I comment? 
simply, simply, if we want to talk in a realistic and objective way, relief is much bigger, much, much bigger than the capacity of civil society organizations in Lebanon, and even bigger than the capacity of international organizations present in Lebanon. Relief requires a, a clear intervention of the United Nations organizations in Lebanon. The state is completely absent and uh, disabled. The explosion has revealed the disability of the country, of the state, in front of the international community. We knew that, the, that this country is, is, has some disabled uh, uh, institutions. For example, the municipality of Beirut didn't really have any, any plan uh, and plan for Beirut to be rebuilt. So uh, even for the streets to be uh, re like rebuilt, so how can they rebuild a, a city? I'm really super afraid. I'm really afraid a lot uh, of reaching this stage amid this lack of trust of the international community in the Lebanese state. The international community need, uh, needs to... Uh, needs to make sure that uh, that they are there because I think such a strategy would be really negative on local organization, local NGOs, because uh, the state is being asking them and pressuring them. And if their work is going to change from developmental, uh, from a developmental focus to a relief focus, then this is going to be negative. I think I, maybe some of you will be, uh, maybe a lot of people will be, will be bothered with what I'm saying, but we have worked in, in relief work uh, in 82, uh, when the Israeli uh, uh, were in Lebanon in 82. And, and, um, and we worked in relief because there was a lack uh, uh, of the, of state power. Now, from 92, after the Taif Agreement, till 2010 in Lebanon, the civil society uh, in Lebanon was struggling to move from relief work to developmental work. And uh, if now they will move the work of the local uh, civil society organizations from developmental work to relief work, then this is really scary and threatening and alarming um, for and, and negatively affecting the role of the local civil society organizations. When I went on the ground and saw all the people, I cried and I told them, throw away, um, throw away all these... Um, material from your hand, uh, the, the cleaners and what you're using to clean because it is the role of the state to come and do that. It's not our own role to do some relief work. But we did not really pressure the state to be much more involved in the relief work. The state is arrogant uh, enough to come and question the civil society organizations in, in, in and, and, and how they did not really provide all the people with aid. So they are changing the, uh, the narrative uh, because the state is really afraid of the international community that is not going to provide money to the state. So I think this is going to increase soon because we will not be able to pressure the, the state a lot as civil society organizations. As much as it's important to restructure what has been destroyed, it is really important for us to continue our struggle in building a civil elite capable of protecting the interests of all the people, the state that is capable of uh, implementing a change, a really scary change on the levels of its work. This is a sectarian state and we are calling for human rights. As Lina said, why is the feminist movement in Lebanon a radical movement? Because it believes in secularism against the sectarian patriarchal system. And patriarchy and sectarianism are uh, are both behind 
uh, this this failure of the state. So we, this is this is our struggle. We're fighting both levels. All the faces of this sectarian system are linked to external states and are now are now uh, on on the spotlight because the explosion deepened uh, deepened the, the, the crisis we don't have any national political regime in lebanon they are all affiliated to the to the to, to external uh, countries i think the iranian and the american and the saudi plans and agendas for lebanon are all agendas that are not in the favor and in the service of the country at all they are just to increase the authorities of these states including the european authorities inside lebanon and macron the president of france came to lebanon so that he brings back the french humiliation to lebanon and not to restructure what has been destroyed in lebanon the world is facing a struggle to take over authority in Lebanon and every party is trying to find its own personal interests in Lebanon. For example, Russia is now, uh, is now doing a, a medical hospital, a civil, civilian hospital, uh, for the injured from the explosion. Um, a week after, my friends told me that they went back to, to Russia. They're not still there. So after the, the cameras were not on the spotlight and after the distribution of aid disappeared, they left. Um, so they all want their own interests. And the only hope is that people get out of their sectarian affiliations and not to be uh, not to be affiliated with their with a, with a, with the sectarian figures because all of them disappointed the Lebanese people and all of them are corrupt and all of them are corrupt politically and uh, financially and on all levels. So that uh, people are away from this sectarian mobilization, so that people can bring some hope and some change. The only internal hope I can think of is that people recognize and understand that their own interests are to fight for, for their own rights by themselves and between themselves. So this is what we achieved in October 17. It, it has broken some of the taboos and, um, that, were, that were in Lebanon. I am against um, capital punishment, but I do like how we, uh, we, we delivered some messages in the Martyrs Square after the explosion when we, when we put some uh, signs uh, calling for death penalty for our political leaders because we want to hold them accountable. It's really important for us to hold them accountable. I would say the feminist movement in Lebanon succeeded in so many ways, especially in making the demands of women part of the revolutionary demands think this is really important and huge and this wouldn't have happened uh, without the accumulation of the feminist struggle for over 20 years now so this is since the the the, the feminist movement developed developed into um, uh, a movement for demands a movement to pressure for a bigger feminist movement to make it a social movement so uh, I remember how much we struggled to have our own feminist movement full of demands because all these organizations were working in relief work only. But today I would say that this has proven, this, is, this has become fruitful because there is awareness 
on the social level on on the importance of women and the role of women and the importance of gender and its relation to democracy and considering the rights of women as 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 a prerequisite for human rights when it comes to uh, to uh, private spaces and public spaces women rights is a backbone the cornerstone for building a state of citizenship uh, a civil state and and a full citizenship among women and men and all genders because personal status laws don't only uh, differentiate and discriminate between men and women but also between women themselves because they end on their own status. Uh, so personal status laws in Lebanon are highly sector So our historic demand for the movement is a unified personal status law in Lebanon, which is the main demand we had in the protests in October 17, in addition to providing the Lebanese citizenship to, uh, to the, their, their sons and daughters for Lebanese women and to fight uh, domestic violence and put an end to any discrimination that face women. We were in the streets and we were in, in spaces and places where, where women issues and, and demands of women and of the feminist movement historically um, exceeded being uh, feminist demands, but also have become uh, a, a a movement for change and also the changing the quota for for women to increase the quota for women in the parliament so i think this is the point of strength of the feminist movement so i'm really scared that this will be lost in relief work despite all the need for relief work so i would really say that the united nations should come and join lebanon and take over relief work so uh if I, I would I would just like to talk for two minutes about the situation of Iraq, generally speaking. You know, sects, same formation, political parties, sectarian political parties, and of course, we have another problem, which is which is uh, choosing women as leaders in political parties. Uh, require uh, their own ideas to be patriarchal. Most of the women in the parliament in, in Iraq, we have 84 women in the parliament of Iraq, and most of them hold patriarchal mentalities and, and ideas and norms. So, and, and, and in a certain committee, uh, we have five women who are part of one political party trying to to make our work really harder and uh, so how can women leave their households with these ideas because men failed all these countries have their uh, their three presidents as men their prime ministers, their presidents, and and the, the head of the parliaments are men in Lebanon and in Iraq, and even in the consultant of the of the foreign minister is is really patriarchal. I think maybe the the foreign minister uh, is much more open and less patriarchal maybe than her. So. In our country, the revolution, in, in the revolution in Iraq, the role of women is really huge. Despite all these situations, a lot of women were killed, were kidnapped, were arrested, were detained. A doctor last week in Iraq was killed because 
someone said that she hasn't uh, doesn't have the right to visit the 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 American ambassador and who 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 does it have to do with her uh, who actually puts the conditions on people on whom to visit so militias in Iraq have a huge role and there are some explosions and kidnappings uh, we do desire a change we desire to change these political parties who are affiliated with the neighboring countries but they are not affiliated with Iraq so I think this is our main problem in, in Iraq they're all affiliated with other regional uh, states even uh, in, in, in when they appear on TV and on the media, uh, men who belong to religious Islamist uh, parties, they only think uh, of, 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 uh, of victimizing uh, women and on limiting women's roles. We are very proud of the strength of women in all these areas around the Arab world especially in, in Lebanon and in Iraq. They accept to die, but they don't accept these, these decisions that are sectarian and, and, and really limiting their, their roles, generally speaking. So if you have any questions um, for us, let us know. We all need to support each other. And you as Lebanese women are examples for us that we are very proud of of all these women who are our professors and their strength is our strength and their uh, their strong will is our strong will so please go ahead um Muzin, thank you so much everyone uh, i i'm really proud that i'm part of this feminist movement in this region because what is happening now in Egypt and in, in the region and uh, in Iraq and in Kurdistan. So this solidarity with all the women in Lebanon and the feminists around the world is really a great example of how, of how this is a participatory movement in this region with all its complexities and sects and all the varieties of problems that this region is going through and to build to build on the on what has been said i think i think that part of why this caucus is continuing and uh, is is is, is uh, successful is the fact that we do have some knowledge exchange uh, opportunities and, and continuous meetings and um, for example today we're talking about how to make our solidarity effective with the women in, in Beirut and how can the caucus and all these women uh, continue to, to, to empower this feminist, this feminist movement because this is um, this is a movement of demands first of all and we need to move beyond the relief work and the grassroots level and how we all uh, make up this movement we all contribute to building and forming and making this movement successful so i would like to really thank all our friends who are not only in the lebanese women but all even the, the women who are residing in lebanon how can we do an initiative by the caucus and by the women of the caucus to support Lebanon and to be in solidarity with the feminists and the politicians in Lebanon. 
such as in Iraq or those who have um, an international experience. So the main idea is, um, is, is how the, what's the politics behind the feminist movement. But the feminist movement knows how to mobilize and gather people because it is part of the people and because uh, within its uh, feminist values, it gathers people from all the backgrounds to, to reach a decision on, on things, on important issues. So uh, for example, in Rwanda, uh, uh, Rwanda uh, uh, went through a crisis and, 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 and we were capable we were capable in Rwanda of having a group that is putting the, the issues of uh, feminists on the table and to shed light on them. We tried men but we tried men, we know their cor how corrupt they are, we know how patriarchal they are and how sectarian they are. But, but now we reached the decision that Rwanda is a country where uh, the parliament is mostly headed by women and it was empowered and developed after the crisis, not before it. So, for example, we can, uh, we can propose a political initiative uh, for, a, for, for more representation of women in a transitional government. Or, for example, I'm thinking of, uh, with you, I'm thinking how we can uh, enhance the voice of the feminists and, and also the voice of those people, including men, women, young men, and young girls and children in, in Lebanon, to advocate on an international level. So I know there are so many visits from different regional uh, groups, and I know Macron is visiting again, and, uh, and David uh, Schenker is coming again. So how can we have some demands for them uh, not only as uh, aid or support, but rather as a political presence and the question about uh, solidarity and support. So how can resources be reached? Because the state is now getting so many uh, resources, but it's not enough and women need so much resources and need much more services. How can we suggest from other from other experiences, for example, from Iraq, who have been through this for, for so many years now. Uh, just like what Jumana mentioned, and I agree with her generally, but how can we reach experiences that are more, much more efficient and effective, and how can we learn from others' lessons? How can and will will be will be after this this convening today an initiative for for women? Uh, if uh, if for example Lina Abu Habib would would agree to be with us and the women of this caucus to form a radical feminist voice and. And by radical, I only mean that we, that we said demand our, like we suggest and we propose our demands uh, on a political level. It might be the fact that uh, it would be like, for example, women uh, is behind the, behind the slogan, all is all, that stands for politicians, meaning that we want to get rid of all of them. We want women all uh, to be here and to be empowered. Thank you so much, Muzin. Um, I'm really delighted to be with you today. I wanna suggest something that is linked to what you mentioned. Um, for, um, by the way, our friends from Iraq uh, say, say the expression in Arabic, meaning all is all, as the Lebanese say, So Muzan, what you are proposing is really important. 
very important and I think uh, its timing is very important. Um, it is inspired by the crime, uh, the genocide that took place in Beirut. I think we need to be together. If uh, my friends in Lebanon also agree with me, we need to have a initiative by uh, feminist movements um, that like, not uh, not parts of the feminist movements, but, but more of a participatory approach of a feminist movement that that believes in uh, in this participatory approach, and the initiative needs to be beyond the reform. Uh, so not only uh, about the reform, because time is over for reform now. I think what is important now is, you know, uh, a lot, uh, uh, a lot of our uh, leaders like like the specificities of each context, but I don't think there's any specificity for any of our countries. Uh, it's just disgusting. We, we maybe in Lebanon now we we were distinguished with this uh, massacre, but. Uh, but we're talking about the same oppressive, oppressive uh, systems in all countries around the Arab world. So I think the initiative w uh, needs to be needs to needs to uh, strive from uh, from the feminist movement, but not only uh, in Lebanon. Uh, so this initiative. Is, is heading to outside Lebanon also. We are done talking to our uh, regimes. They actually stopped any channels for communication with them. We spent decades to talk to them and, and pressure them and uh, voice our demands. These are regimes that cannot be reformed at all. If they are reformed for, for, for one percent, let's say, they will collapse eventually. So so I would I would say starting from the massacre that happened in Beirut and 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 to include all the and to include all the all the issues of women in the region, so it might start from Beirut but extend to the neighboring countries and to the regional countries. So I think now there is a sympathy um, uh, in a big extent with Lebanon. Uh, I will not analyze the reasons behind this uh, sympathy. I know it's not for free, there must be something behind it. Just like what happened um, with our regimes in Egypt and uh, in Jordan and in Palestine, etc. This uh, sympathy is, uh, is actually strengthening our regimes. It is not our role to do relief work, but it is our role to monitor the relief work and to make sure that that this relief work is based on on uh, is based on uh, on also feminist uh, ideas and uh, reconciliation and also that this relief is not a new channel for corruption so i think in terms of proposing a feminist voice a radical uh, participatory feminist voice and to um, to 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 also demand um, a radical change because we reached as i said the stage where it's e it's either us or all it's a life or death situation um, so do you have any questions i think we have some questions in the chat um, thank you so much muzin i think this is exactly what we should be doing. 
exactly this is the start and we remain together in heart and spirit I just want to add to what uh, Lena has mentioned that we are first really in need to be strong and to radicalize the feminist movement as a political movement, not as a relief work movement. Relief shouldn't be at the heart of our work at all. What is at the heart of our work is how to make this movement very efficient and effective politically uh, to, in order to bring some change. And this can be done. Uh, for example, there's an initiative by UN Women in Lebanon to to start of uh, to start to start calling um, for gender needs and to to include gender needs and all the relief work and all the priorities of women uh, to to include them in these services and all these uh, relief channels. So to ensure that all the relief channels take take into consideration all the needs of women and how to prioritize the how to prioritize the needs of women in the services and the relief work because as we've seen relief work did not really take into consideration gender needs and now here i'm not talking about uh, food and water i'm talking about the strategic uh, needs that would um, allow women to take decisions and to make decisions and to be an effective partner and i think in the upcoming period um, the the crisis and the crime of beirut needs uh, years of work years of work and years of uh, service provisioning and might not really uh, 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 like uh, alleviate the impact uh, so we do need to monitor and hold all the services and all the relief work accountable. So we need to understand how, to what extent are these services and relief work reaching women, allowing women to be partners in decision making? To what extent is development uh, for men and women equally without any discrimination so our 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 main um, struggle is to fight for women's rights don't think that if you see a lot of women in the streets they're strong in the streets then then our fight is is uh, is not as strong as before no that means that our fight still needs a lot more to be done we need to think of this initiative and to co to coordinate and to move towards a feminist agenda in the reconstruction efforts and in the relief work taking place in Lebanon. I think we will reach this because um, because because this is something that is already there. Uh, all our ideas, uh, our feminist uh, struggle, and how to intervene to put an end to discrimination against women. I think uh, during this uh, period, you will listen a lot from us to help us with advocacy and uh, with, uh, with the, the, uh, the pressuring work, how to pressure the international community and how the approach can be uh, based on rights, and based on women and men needs equally without any discrimination. And, and this, this, the same goes to the relief work. Approach to relief work needs also to be um, uh, based on gender equality. I want to agree with everyone about the, the, the feminist move, uh, initiative that will, um, will be made now. And, um, it's true that we started um, as an organization moving from development in, re in like uh, regional areas in Lebanon and now 
it's really dangerous to uh, move to relief work because it's not our responsibility it's the responsibility of the state and of the politicians and we need to hold them accountable we need to tell them that hey you should go and work on rebuilding beirut and not us i just wanted to show you some pictures in the office because uh, we have some destruction um so here are some of the food parcels that we're distributing and here you can see our office in beirut uh, this uh, this wood is uh, like this was destroyed. This is in the middle of Jemaize. Jemaize is empty today. Here uh, we moved into a sort of a clinic. We're working on it because I am sure that all the civil uh, hospitals uh, that came uh, from abroad by other states left Beirut. I don't know why. Now Jemaize is really empty. You all know the street in Jemaize. It's, uh, it's really empty. You can see all these buildings without any glasses in Jemaize. All its citizens left them completely. All the doors uh, were affected and destroyed. The situation is really huge and and uh, it's it's a uh, it's a disaster, it's a real disaster. And I will not say those are just feminist demands. I would call them those are feminist rights. It's not just that we are calling for demands. It's more that uh, that uh, that uh, we're 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 demanding our rights. If 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 we are to build a, a civil and democratic uh, state, then this is a right. This is not a demand in all the the region. I just wanted to show you what's going on here and our strength as an organization. All our board members are women present now at the office. Each is, uh, is in charge of one of the things that we're working on. So someone is responsible for the medical equipment and others are uh, responsible for, for uh, fixing the windows and the the doors so we're doing a uh, really huge work and we're distributing food and we're trying to um, take the role of the state so i think i really need to salute here all the women of lebanon who went on the streets and worked i just wanted to um, put some face into the picture that we're talking about Thank you for listening. It is a sad picture of Beirut because I know that all of our uh, Arab friends are watching us today and um, they're sharing the live uh, meeting on Facebook. So, so they asked us to show you uh, the office and how Beirut is really hurt today, how the disaster is huge. and. And it's only the volunteers and the civil society organizations and the women on the ground who are leaving their work and they're not making ends meet and they're not uh, following uh, their allowances. They're just there on the ground to help. Some of the women of the, of the caucus told me, hey, Joseph, uh, yeah, we really want to help Lebanon in any way possible. Uh, so... I really salute all their efforts um, and this is all because thanks to Nazra and thanks to the caucus I think that hand in hand we can build that we can build an initiative uh, that is based on rights and not only on demands perhaps it might be an opportunity but I hate the word opportunity um, maybe disasters can build an opportunity for later on so that we can learn from uh, like all the disasters that took place in our countries so that we can move to other uh, to other uh, um, approaches because i can't see any any other uh, solution but a democratic and civil state 
with our political activism. And all the, all the women from the caucus called me and they wanted to uh, provide uh, donations and to support us. And I told them that all we need is just to network. And this is part of the accumulation of, of work, uh, of previous colleagues from 50 to 60 years who are working on the rights of women. So thank you, Muslims. Thank you, Razan. Thank you to all the women in the caucus who are giving us this opportunity today to uh, share the crisis of Beirut. I really thank you a lot for your spirit, the spirit of our women, this feminist spirit and this feminist belonging and this spiritual belonging uh, for our presence uh, in our countries. I hope that one day we can change something about our countries. The most important thing is that we do have voices and we have minds and, and, and we are present on this political realm. So each time I will say again that we're benefiting a lot from you and I hope that one day this feminist movement will have a really huge role um, to change all the policies in all the countries. So if it changes policies in Lebanon, it might change policies in Iraq and all the other neighboring countries. But I think we all are close to each other and we have the similar policies and similar mentalities that we're facing. There are some uh, questions on the chat that need to be answered. And I just want to say, uh, Lina and uh, Jumana are the young feminists among us because they always say that we're from the same generation, but they're from the young generation. Um, I will leave because uh, I, have some. Uh, I will continue. Thank you. Thank you a lot. So um, I'm sorry, I had other arrangements. So, uh, thank you, Razan. Thank you, Razan, for being with us. This is such a dear group to my heart, and I'm really happy to be with you. I hope one day the role of the caucus will be much stronger. Thank you, everyone. I just want to say, long live feminist solidarity. And I think what's giving us strength is the feminist solidarity among us. I'm just checking some of the questions in the chat. Our friend Amel Grami from Tunisia is just alarming us of the importance of documenting this experience to archive it uh, in the feminist archive because the history is not archiving any of the feminist contributions, uh, not only on the social level, but also on the political level and also on the economic level. So I think, I think the feminist movement is starting to archive uh, these issues. And there's also another question by Emily Grami, which is, to what extent will the feminist movement work on enhancing accountability? Uh, so since Amal did not really talk much, can we hear from you, Amal? Can we hear your voice? <clears throat> we love your laugh, Amal. Um, and it, it's okay because we're giving some space for the youngest uh, feminist among us. I'm not, if we want to talk uh, in, a, in, a, in feminist words, I think Lina and Jumana are the experts. Um, uh, I was never a feminist. Uh, I'm really honest with you. 
uh, I never had a feminist belonging. Um, not in the sense that I don't support human rights. I am a human rights defender and, uh, and also I defend uh, the rights of the disabled. Um, so we're really interested in understanding the needs of the disabled people, especially disabled women, since this is part of your expertise. And then we can give the young feminists among us uh, the floor to talk. I think that the discrimination against uh, disabled women is is more is is higher is is even the double of the discrimination. It's a double burden. Let's say let's say it's a double burden. So, so many types of discrimination. For example, uh, we suffer discrimination on the level of disability, physical disability, or other disability. So they would be like, oh, they have a university degree. Oh, well, this is a superhero. Um, as if they're not entitled to that. And also if it's a woman, if it's a woman, then uh, she would be also uh, discriminated based on gender. And there is also uh, there is also how women are always bounded by some restrictions of getting married or um, or giving birth and. Uh, and because of disabled women can do these, so they consider them as a thing, not as a human. Uh, unless if she is really strong and can handle it. So I think this is a really controversial issue. I don't know, Lina and Jumana, what's your input about this? Because I think, I don't know if it's, it's the right thing or not, but I, I feel, this is my personal feeling that uh, uh, for example, my own uh, field is, is graphic design, so uh, you wouldn't need to have some skills. Uh, as, uh, so I didn't face any discrimination in my work related to my disability, maybe because I was too professional. But when it comes to social work, we do feel discrimination. And uh, when I when I was a uh, when I was a uh, candidate for the Beirut municipality election in 2016, um, I was asked uh, uh, if I was uh, actually um, if I got four votes because I was a I was a disabled woman who ran for the elections. In fact, no, we had a platform, we had a reform platform, but people thought they had this. Um, uh, they had this thought that maybe because I, I have a disability, then maybe I'm um, getting people's sympathy. And I said no. I, I, and, uh, and I was also asked if I was discriminated during the uh, election uh, campaign. Um, and I said no, because I was not discriminated against. And also, I got some votes, not because I'm disabled, but because I really worked hard for the campaign. So I think when it comes to the gender and disability, I'm not an expert, but this is my thought. Thank you, Amel. I, I really hope to meet you in person, but, but I hope one day I will be able. Lina, you had a question in the chat, in the Q&A. Uh, the question is, why do you think none of the political leaders have apologized uh, or offered condolences to the people? So why do you think none of the political leaders have apologized or offered condolences to the people? First of all, um, one of my dear friends raised this question and she works in and, and, and issues of reproductive uh, health and rights of reproductive health and sexual rights. 
and uh, she's one of my friends that I really respect. She's one of those feminist uh, voices uh, that are like uh, the young feminist voices, and I hope one day we'll see her in a leadership position. Uh, why? Why didn't we uh, hear them apologizing? Um, I just want to say a, a short anecdote. Um, before the explosion, one of my feminist friends, and she's attending today with us, her name is Karima, and I would like to, uh, to greet her. I told her that, uh, so now is Eid al-Adha, and uh, the president of Lebanon did not, uh, did not greet the people with, uh, with Eid. She said, well, this is right, but he also did not uh, congratulate and greet the people with the, uh, at the, the other Eid, Eid al-Futr after Ramadan. And then now when the explosion took place, um, it's evident that he doesn't even provide his condolences to people. So he's not there in their, in their, uh, in their happiness and sadness and their tragedies and, and, and their uh, celebrations. This just shows how this political um, these, these political figures who are criminals humiliate the people. They do not care about the suffering of the people. And, and they are not capable of accomplishing their basic responsibility of just saying to the people, just saying to the people that uh, they, they are sorry for their loss or for what's going on. I just think that this is a, this is a group of politicians who is really corrupt criminals and who don't care about the people. Now, when it comes to the question of Amal Ikrami, our friend um, from Tunisia, she was in, in February in Beirut with us at AUB, at the American University of Beirut. And to answer her question, um, which is about to what extent will the feminists work on enhancing the principle of accountability. I think that, um, okay, well, we will not do some relief work. And I agree completely with Jumana that it's not our work or responsibility to do relief work. It's our responsibility to um, hold them accountable. Did we put some... Um, standards, feminist standards for this accountability. I will give an example. Um, when, when the crisis of, when the Syrian refugee crisis started, and I had a meeting with some of the uh, funders who were leaders in 2015 or 2016, I don't remember, but the international institution that is supposed to provide aid to refugees, women and men refugees in Lebanon, is until this day saying that we only give um, some sort of a debit card so that they can withdraw something really minimal like a 20 sal. Uh, Lebanese pound, they give it to the men in the household of the refugees and not to the, men, to the women. You know what this means for a, from a feminist perspective? Lina, I'm just afraid that tomorrow when the rent is under the name of the dead husband and, and the, the woman, the woman in, uh, is there and can't say anything and can't get anything, so, uh, yes, uh, we have a question now. Uh, we have a question on, on Facebook uh, for Lina. Uh, we uh, we did a charter for feminist events in uh, uh, in our organization and, and also as I heard from Jumana from you and women we had 40 feminist committees um, 
including Jumana and my friend Diana Boabbas, and it was uh, it was a group of feminist organizations with a participatory approach, and they were working with uh, women refugees. Um, and I think Jumana, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, it's being translated, this document is being translated and it's really clear, it has no ambiguity. Uh, it just shows how we will be um, holding everyone accountable. So the most important thing for us is no one is away from being accountable. No one will be with all his women and men who are uh, corrupt. Uh, so this is a charter for us to use vis-à-vis um, -vis the charter and vis-à-vis -vis the women who are working and uh, the funders. Uh, so I don't know what to add to what has been said. Their experiences are really big. Uh, but in my uh, experience and accountability, it's a communitarian participatory work. And if today we cannot do some uh, real networking, and if we don't all uh, agree on, uh, on a certain vision to reach on the short term and then three years, for example, because all of them have their arms and they have their uh, their their their, uh, their their arms and their um, uh, their own police and and i think if we can always monitor this closely and say that we did reach this and we provide success stories on what has been done because people would like to see the achievements of the feminist movement even those who are really close to us in our communities and our organizations and personal lives, they don't know what we have achieved. So, so, so I am not uh, older than 20 in, in terms of my work in, as a feminist. So my feminist work isn't longer than 20 years, but um, there needs to be an online platform, an online system to to build on our knowledge, even if the disaster is really huge, we need to we need to benefit other people. Even if it's a, if, even if it's a negative disaster that took place, we need to 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 build on our knowledge and on each other's knowledge. We remember how the explosion of Cairo changed the system, and uh, and also um, and also in Lebanon it will change the system. So we need to know how to. Uh, how to make this explosion an opportunity. We have other questions, Amal. Since I am, since my expertise, uh, I can use my expertise to help with a platform. So, so if you're working on preparing something, I would suggest that, uh, for example, by email, I can, I can provide you with technical steps to document the feminist movement and all the achievements and what, what comes after the achievement. So to continue and follow up on the work even after the achievements so that we can document uh, everything so that other women can build on, on our work in the present because women can do everything all at once. So uh, small objectives to build on each other uh, to document them. Those that were documented before, uh, we build on them, we document others and this would help us in our future work. Dr. Afaf al-Jabri asks you, what is the agenda for the feminist movement today and how can feminist organizations today in the region support? Support? Joanna, if you can answer, please. It's on Facebook, right? I don't know. Um, I can see also Amal Grammy is raising her hand. If you can please answer her now and then we finish the questions and do something else. I don't want to take uh, a lot of time. If you can just please answer it. Like what are the 
possible uh, models of relief and uh, solidarity? No. Um, what what is what is it, the feminist movement achievement and achieving and how can we support it? I would say I I would say that a lot of the organizations working on relief uh, are trying to say that we don't want to work on relief per se, but uh, more on gender issues and to add the like to add the gender issues into the relief work. So uh, as I said, we will be asking for this support. We are in need to pressure the international community and the funders to include to include the special cases and needs of women in these um, aids. So I don't have a ready-made answer now, but I do have a vision of of, uh, of what should be done. I think we need to. I need. I think we need to build on our uh, understanding and our demands before before we uh, provide our demands to the feminists around the Arab region to help us in our fight. But definitely, we will need the support and the solidarity. So this is also a question by uh, Dr. Bushra from Morocco. She's also a member of the caucus. Um, she's asking about the agenda and also what is the future of the protests in Lebanon, the revolution in Lebanon amid the current situation in Lebanon. Another question, what are the demands that around which women were unified and what are the reforms that civil society organizations identified? How can the electoral system, well, this is a technical question on the electoral system. How can the electoral, elect, electoral system uh, pro, provide a comprehensive strategy to dismantle the sectarian system? Amal, if you can please answer since you were a candidate previously to the elections. And also Josephine, right? And also Josephine can answer. I will help you. I'm just gonna answer. Uh, I'm gonna answer two questions. The, the, the movement, the, the, the protest movement in Lebanon today is not unified. So it's not built on uh, on common demands, but there is a basis which is uh, building a civil and democratic state um, as agreed on in the constitution of uh, Lebanon. This is a common demand of all the uh, of all the civil society organizations and the people in the protest. But how can we? set aside all these political parties who have been in power for 30 years now. We don't have, I, uh, I can say that we don't have any uh, all, like idea uh, on what should be, done, should be done. Just like the, the party that I belong to, which is Muwatinun wa Muwatinat fi Dawla. So it, it, it has put an agenda for 18 months. Uh, for, a year, for a year and a half, and because we have a, res uh, a lack of resources, so, um, so there's a plan for 18 months, and I hope that everyone can, um, can, 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 uh, can talk on the group on how what can be done, what should be done to, for us to, to get out of this crisis. Now, when it comes to the electoral law, I think... Um, that the the dream is uh, to have a, uh, to have a, a, an electoral system based on like percentages um, but now we have the same people uh, running for the same positions so i think they will uh, 
they will actually take over the whole country. Um, so when we build a state and all what this means, and when it's a strong state, um, capable of holding everything up, then we can actually talk about a different electoral system. Um, it's a dream, but we hope to reach it soon. So Amal, would you like to add something? I think also Josephine agrees with me. I think that the state, whatever the law that it promulgates, people will run for the positions. Uh, we will run as activists. This is from my side, because this is the only way for us to be engaged politically. Uh, from my side, I'm preparing for the municipal elections as of now. And we are all to, uh, with you, we support you. We have a question from Elizabeth. Are and popular candidacy are not being put forward? So popular candidacies are not being... Uh, so uh, Muzan doesn't get the question. <clears throat> uh, if you can please, Elizabeth, clarify your question. So I think she's saying that the candidacies, candidacies of the people uh, outside the existing parties, are those taking place? Do we have uh, popular candidacies outside the existing parties? I think this is her question. I think uh, now we took all the questions. Uh, so yes, Elizabeth, this is what she means. Um, so we will give the final word to Jumana and then Lina about the previous questions. I think we covered mostly everything. Um, I just want to say that I really hope that this session is a starting point for, for the work of the caucus for us to build on the initiative that you talked about. Um, I think that uh, we entered uh, a decisive phase where there is no way to return around because if we go back, that means we're going back to our uh, inevitable death. So we need to stick to each other's side to uh, get rid of the system. <laughs> so I would like to say that um, that uh, injustice was never a destiny and oppression was never a destiny of the people. People were not destined to be oppressed all the time. We do not want to live in exploitation. We want to live uh, uh, in dignity, and this is our right. We are demanding our own rights. Um, the hope, regardless of all the difficulties, is not broken. Hope is not broken, regardless of all the pain. We are at least capable of um, giving this hope to the next generation. And I think that the answer uh, to, the, to all the corruption of the political parties uh, came from the people on Saturday after the explosion when we went to the streets in thousands and when the security forces faced us with the bullets. I would just like to salute the feminist solidarity I salute all the men and women who are um, fighting against injustice and oppression always. I would like to salute all the people who are cleaning, cleaning the glasses and the rubble and the dust after the explosion in order for us to reach a political change that is democratic. Thank you, Muzan. Thank you, Nasra. Uh, Nasra. For, uh, for the solidarity that we really need. This is much needed. Thank you for my colleagues from Lebanon, and I hope to see you, not online, but face-to-face. -face. 
and in other meetings where we can map policies to develop all the things that we were talking about and, and to build on the needs of women as priorities of relief work. Yes, we will see each other soon and hug each other. Thank you, everyone. We learned a lot. And I hope that our pure solidarity, our effective solidarity reaches you. We are trying to coordinate an initiative. This is just the start, not the end. We are always together. I would like to thank everyone, um, all those who helped behind the scenes for this caucus to take place for this uh, meeting to take place, I mean. Um, so a lot of them uh, don't reveal their names and a lot of volunteers who wouldn't like to reveal their names because of situations in Egypt, but I thank them all, uh, individuals and organizations for all their efforts. Uh, I'm really thankful and we send our salutations to Beirut from the heart. Thank you so much. See you everyone.